Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Human Talk. We have been away for a couple of weeks, but we are back now with a bumper episode. Today, we are going on another backstage tour to look at some of MA's processes that guarantee the best possible product quality. We have been granted access to the assembly team and the engineers in their hidden test room. Access not everyone gets. We will hear from Alex, who is one of the hardware designers, about the processes that are used when designing and building the MA products. And as you will see, these products are still all handmade. We hope you will enjoy this small glimpse inside the quality testing processes at the factory, ensuring that you get a great product. Hi, this is the development and test room, our MA lab for hardware components. Yes, even the single components are tested before we use them for our PCBs. All raw components we need are checked before we use them. Even the inside of a bare PCB is checked in the design process, as you can see here on the monitor. Of course, we check the design itself. Nowadays, we can do this during the design process with state-of-the-art software, as you can see here on the left monitor. But still, we develop a test board first to check all the functions and the production parameters. For example, the soldering profiles for each PCB. Once we know that we have tested components in stock, we check the quality after each single step in the process. Sometimes it is a visual inspection, but in many places we double check the components with self-created test tools and test adapters. This allows us to identify any variance that might lead to incorrect behavior. Each step of the production process is checked as well, so we have a constant quality control in place. But it does not end here. Once a console or another product have been finished, it will go through the final test department. Here our test engineers are testing all components again, and of course the complete product. Once the single product has passed all the tests, we will run a 24-hour burn-in test, just to ensure that we have not missed an issue that only shows once a product is running for a longer time. Thank you. Bye. I would like to thank everyone at the factory for helping with that. As you could see at the end, it's important for Michael to unwind and what better way than win a good session on the Metallica Pinball. After all, work hard, pinball hard. So, next we turn to our favourite feature, MA People. This week we have some fantastic friends from India and Southeast Asia. Thanks to everyone that's been sending these in and without further ado, let's enjoy MA People. Hi, I'm Beckett Tundatil, 
and uh, I'm, a, I'm a lighting designer based in, in Mumbai, India. I've been using the MA3 software in the last few weeks and I must say it's a fantastic software and the console, it's a very unique console with great features. I can't wait to you know start using it on my shows and even the features like the MVR, GDTF, I've been, I've been trying things out on them and I must say it's fantastic. Uh, everyone please take care and stay safe. Bye. Hi, my name is Roosevelt D'Souza, I'm from Bombay, India. Uh, during this lockdown, I've been able to do a lot of stuff which I could not do. I started learning how to cook, uh, meditation and yoga. I speak to a lot of my friends, thanks to MA India and Wiki for signing me up for the MA University e-learning. It's been really helpful. Um, things are not really good in Bombay right now. I'm waiting for things to open up so I can get back to work. Uh, hopefully it should be soon. Take care. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm a lighting designer from Singapore. Uh, like much of the world, Singapore has been on lockdown. So I've been taking the time to read, to watch videos and to play around with the MA3 on PC. In fact, uh, I think a week or two ago, I discovered the tracking distance ability, which I think is going to be a very useful function to have. So take care, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we can all see each other in the real world soon. Hi, my name is Ryan Adek. I'm a lighting designer from Thailand. Since the lockdown, we have a lot of time. So me and my LD friends in Thailand, we create a challenge on pre-visualizer. So everybody can show out their work and come to discuss it, exchange their knowledge to improve ourselves and be prepared to when everything comes back to normal. Be safe, everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm Tsonghan Lu from Manila, Philippines. I'm a lighting designer and also an MA lighting consultant and tech support at MetaTech Solutions. Since the pandemic outbreak, we have encouraged most of the lighting designer to take our e-learning platform. And also myself, I have finished my e-learning courses on MA3. And right now, I'm using Grand MA3 on PC and also attending webinars during this pandemic to learn and explore more about the features of Grand MA3. Thank you all so much for everyone that sent in uh, your contributions to this. We've got a bumper bag full. So watch out as you could be in the next episode. Now, following on from the piece about the US theatre school that used MA3D to continue their studies, Joe and Kat have put together an overview of all that's different and great in MA3D now on the Grand MA3 software. So, if you haven't had a look, at the new version, then this is a great place to start. Over to you, Joe and Kat. Hey everybody. Hi. So we're gonna take a couple of minutes to talk about 3D and how that's changed from Grandma 2 to Grandma 3. Yeah, the biggest difference is instead of two programs, it's now all integrated into one. Yes, and that makes it a whole lot easier if you're just trying to do some work on one computer. You don't have to open up another application, you're just opening up another window. You don't have to deal with any extra networking things or loopback adapters or any of that stuff. Yeah, it also means with the new software, we can finally run this on our Macs. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, and if I wanted to use my Mac as a dedicated visualizer computer that maybe I'm going to hook up to on my console, now I can. Absolutely. And if you're going to do that, uh, there is a setting that will show you uh, where you can prioritize the 3D rendering over the rest of the UI just for that computer. Yeah, so I think we, we want to take a look at that setting and everything else that's new in this version that we didn't have in the Grandma 2. So to do that, we've loaded up the demo show onto our console. Mm -hmm. So it's included in the software. If you want to follow along at home, you can. So the new 3D window is a little like a mashup of Grandma 3D and the stage view within Grandma 2. Yeah, like the uh, toolbar that's on the left side, that's going to allow us to like move our camera in and around. We can even toggle in and out of follow mode. So just mm -hmm. like the stage view in the Grandma 2. Also in the title bar, should be familiar, we can change cameras or we can go into the setup mode. But looking here, you'll also see options that you're used to seeing in the separate 3D software, like changing your beam quality. 
You also see options for something new, and that's labels. Labels. Yeah, this will toggle your labels on and off, but there's more options for them in the settings window. Yeah. So if we click on MA under the first tab, rendering again, familiarity. This is uh, a lot like the options that you saw in uh, Grandma 3D for changing your rendering settings. If I go to the miscellaneous tab, here's that 3D priority option that we talked about earlier. This is an option I turn on on my dedicated visualizer computer, but not on the console. And over here in the labels tab, uh, you'll see those same two toggles that we saw in the title bar. Uh, but then you see uh, some additional information if you wanted to show where your fixtures were patched or the name included with the label, you can do that. You also have faders here for the alpha of the background and the text to make things a little more readable for you. On the right hand side, you're going to see something that we both really like. Uh, it's called selection only. This way you're not looking at all of your labels all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I think that these uh, labels are going to be really useful. Like, for example, if we're doing a television show in a studio and we've got a really big rig and I need to figure out there's that one light that's, you know, hitting that audience member or it's flaring that camera, you know, and I need to figure out what light that is. Well, if my uh, 3D environment has been rendered well and it really matches up with my real room, this is going to tell me exactly which light that is. So <laughs> handy. Yeah. And if you're wondering now, where do 3D objects live? Speaking mm. of setting up the environment right, where are they? They're in the patch now. To the patch! Mm. <laughs> and we're in the patch. Your 3D objects are going to be listed just like fixtures. In the demo show file, some of these fixtures are inside the stage elements grouping and others are under truss, just in case you're following along at home. Uh, once you found your object in this window, you can change the scale and the position. You can also move your objects around in the 3D window using your encoder wheels. It's not necessary to give them a fixture ID, but it does make them a little easier to select. You can also add in new objects just like adding in a fixture. They live under the manufacturer set. So that's 3D. Something old, something new. Works for me, works for you. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Uh, on that note, uh, thanks again, Lee, for having us. And uh, oh, thank you to Mr. Stapuff who dropped by and made the shot infinitely better. Perfect. Yeah. Till next time. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, guys. A really good intro there into what's available right now. And it's always nice to see the other cat get involved. And finally, in this bumper episode, we have Paul take us through how using external triggers have taken the console to a show control platform as well as a lighting desk. And if you've ever wondered how linking button presses to the lighting state happens when you're not in control, for example, then this is a great watch. So Paul, over to you. G'day Lee, g'day everyone, welcome back. Today we are gonna chat about external triggers, specifically using the analog inputs on the rear of each and every Grand MA control surface in the two and three range. This is something I feel that gets pretty underutilized and it's unfortunate because utilizing the GPI inputs on the console can be useful in a wide variety of situations. But firstly, what are they? Well, they're referred to as analog remotes in the software, but labeled as DC remote in on the surfaces. What they really are are general purpose input output ports or general purpose interface, depending on who you listen to. Often referred to as just GPIs in our world, mainly because we like to shorten things, uh, but also because we only use them as inputs anyway. So on an MA2, the connector is a D sub 25 connector, allowing for 16 contacts or discrete triggers. However, the MA2 command wing is the exception to this due to its hardware design. On that surface, it's a 15 pin D sub connector, allowing for 12 contacts. The great news is on the Grand MA3 range is that it's a standard D sub 9 pin connector on every surface, including the RPU. So that means in the Grand MA3 world, there are a total of seven discrete contacts per surface. So how do they work? Grand MA2 and Grand MA3 have slightly different approaches to GPIOs. In Grand MA2, it's just a simple switch, on or off. In simple terms, it's really just the closing of a circuit. Look at this diagram. One of the pins on the D sub connector sends out between five and 15 volts DC, and that follows the circuit back to one of the trigger pins. In this diagram, the circuit is open. There's no contact closure. Here you see it closed. 
When the circuit is closed, the input pin triggers in the software, and that's how we get our triggers. And we'll show you how to manage that a little bit later. GrainMA3, however, has a slightly more sophisticated use of the GPIO system. The GPI inputs work on a variable 0 to 10 volt range, meaning you can utilize the GPI inputs on the GrainMA3 to control things like a fader. And there are a plethora of bits of equipment that work in the 0 to 10 volt range. So it's actually quite exciting looking at what the possibilities might be. So they'll also be able to work in the GrainMA2 workflow, which is an open and closed circuit, but in the future they'll be able to do so much more. GPIOs in other systems can be much more sophisticated again. You can have circuits that are normally open that trigger on the closing of the circuit and others that may utilize several GPIO pins to allow for more sophisticated options. But in the MA world, particularly Grain MA2, it works best with circuits that are normally open and the action is the closing of the circuit. This is an important detail you might need when you start playing around with buttons and switches. For all the technical boffins amongst us who want to make sure that we get all the details right, you can actually use an external source for your 5 to 15 volts in Grain MA2 or 0 to 10 volts in Grain MA3. So rather than creating a closed circuit that emanates from your console, like in the diagram I showed you before, you can use an external device to trigger your console. But please, take caution. Anything more than the specified volts coming into your console and you do run the risk of damage. You can fry a circuit board in the blink of an eye, fry being a technical term. So that's all the technical boring stuff out of the way, but what are they and what can they do to help you run your show? Well, I thought we'd have a quick look at a show that we did called Asia's Got Talent. Uh, like all the Got Talents and X Factors and those kind of shows around the world, uh, there are judges that sit out the front that whack a button that triggers an audio cue, a lighting cue, and a video cue. Uh, this clip will show you what I'm talking about. Hi, I'm Desmond, and I'm 20 years old, and I'm from Malaysia. I'm a rapper, and I'm here to rap. Let's hit the show! <laughs> DJ, drop the beat! May I have your attention, please? Yo, the boy over there. Yo, the girl. That's right. This hiding over there. Come go. Right. Right. Yo, you can do it. Desmond, you're almost like 95% of your rap was not on beat. It was kind of hard to listen to. It's been a long day, and you just made it longer. Poor, poor Desmond. I hope he's got a good day job. Each judge has a button in front of them that closes the circuit. So we have a button that is normally open and when the button is pressed, it closes the loop, which our MA sees and triggers all the cues. How does that work and how do we do that in the console? I'll show you here. Okay, so what you're looking at here is your stock standard on PC interface. Uh, it's the same interface you would see on a console, uh, same process for the setup. Uh, so going into setup and under remote inputs setup, is where we're going to set up our GPI control. Uh, analog remotes is what we're looking for. This is also where you would set up MIDI remotes and or DMX directly into the console. Uh, we've already set up our three uh, inputs for the judge's buttons, uh, conveniently named judge one, two, and three. It's as simple as hitting the add button, giving it a name, uh, and then telling the console what you would like it to do. So whether it's gonna trigger an executor, whether it's gonna trigger a command, uh, or whether it's gonna trigger a hard key. So any of the keys on the console you could trigger from here. Uh, command, something helpful like shutdown, or reboot, or delete sequence through. Uh, not particularly helpful, but uh, many other things that would be. Uh, or a specific executor. Uh, you could have a floating page, the, the floating page on the master here. Uh, select the executor and the button. So we've got our three set up here. And of course we can enable and disable. So if we decide that we don't want these things to run, we can just disable them here uh, or re-enable them that way. So let's go to uh, a page that we've set up just here. And what you're looking at is uh, a fairly stereotypical uh, set up that uh, we would, or approach that we would have for a TV show. Uh, so we would have a base look, which is, uh, you know, audience lit and all the LED set uh, scenic elements uh, lit and in their state. Uh, and then, so when we trigger another sequence, it takes lights away from that sequence, but uh, it would never be overwritten. So we certainly almost always turn off on overwritten off. Um, 
And so what happens is uh, the judge hits their button and it triggers the, the queue. Now, one thing to think about is that you only want it to go off once. So when they hit the button, buzzer goes off and we want that to happen only once. We don't want the judge to sit there and keep pushing the button because that would be annoying. So how do we get around that? Well, the first thing we do is write a little command in the window uh, of all the other things that we want to happen external to lights just coming on in the queue. Uh, the first thing is MIDI Note 1, and that triggers a sound effect in QLab for us. So we would have QLab set up separately uh, and send a MIDI note to QLab, which would make the buzzer sound. That's audio taken care of. Uh, but of course, every time we hit that button, that command would run. So what we need, what we do is move the sequence uh, to another page. So simply move executor 1.1 at executor 2.2, moves it to a second page so that the GPI would then be triggering an empty space. Uh, and we also change the appearance of the sequence and I'll show you why in a second. So go on the button there. Our sequence changes color. Uh, and if we go to page two, you'll see that the sequence is now active. So we've probably changed the judge to red. We've taken the blue out. We've made some other changes. Our sound effect has run, uh, but we still have two other judges who are doing their uh, business. And when they trigger their cue, again, same thing happens. So pretty straightforward. And then we have a little reset macro here, which is just move executor 2.1 through 2.3 back to executor 1.1. Uh, and also turning them off. So once they are now off, uh, once they're now off and changing the appearance, we are now reset, ready to go for the next sequence. Uh, back to our normal bass look, everybody's happy. So as you can see, very, very simple, uh, but effective workflow for buzzers in a TV show. So there you have it. Uh, it's a pretty simple process. Uh, and once you start playing around with the macros and the commands, you can really take your workflow to the next level. Uh, but it's not just TV that these types of triggers are useful for. Uh, imagine a contact closure on a door in a set piece in a theatre show. And when that door closes, it triggers a sound effect, changes the lighting state, might bring on a backstage worker. Uh, same with a lift. If you have a stage lift that grounds out at the bottom, you might have a contact closure that closes that turns on a work light for somebody to uh, do a stage changeover. So there are lots and lots of different applications in different environments uh, that make GPIs really useful. It's not just external things that you might want triggering your console. I've got a little box here that I sometimes drag around and I'll give this to a vision switcher or an associate or a follow spot caller and let them run smoke machines or switch screen inputs or change different parts of the show that I might not be able to pay attention to all the time. Imagine being able to have a foot switch and the right could be go and the left one could be go back, freeing up your hands to do other things like surfing Instagram or texting your friends. Uh, so there are so many different applications of GPIs that uh, really, once you start going into that world, you can think of a thousand different options to trigger events in your show. I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, we'll be back again soon with some more interesting stuff. Well, I for one have learned something there and that's not how to rap. Um, <sighs> thanks, Paul. And don't forget, if you have any additional questions for any of our guests, then please leave them in the comments and they will be happy to get back to you. So there we are, another episode done and dusted. And thank you all for watching. If you like what we do, please like, subscribe, etc. But most of all, please stay safe and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>